Okay, then I think uh, it's time to get started with our uh, second presentation, who will be given by uh, Dr. Gabriele Schweikert. Uh, Gabriele received her PhD at the Max Planck Institute in Tübingen, and she focused on developing machine learning techniques for computational gene findings. And from 2011 to 2012, she was a research associate at the Wellcome Trust Center for Biology in Edinburgh. And then from 2012 to 2015, she was a Mary Curie Research Fellow and an EMBO Fellow at the University of Edinburgh. And since 2018, she leads her own research group uh, with a focus on computational epigenomics, also, uh, at, sorry, at the University of Dundee. And since 2019, she also heads uh, the Computational Epigenomics Research Group in the Cyber Valleys Division of Computation Biology. And Gabriele is, the, is one of the recipients of the very prestigious UKRI Future Leaders Fellowship. And she will give a talk about machine learning for cancer epigenomics. And we're very exciting, excited to have you as a speaker. And uh, please take it away from here. Um, as you notice, I'm probably a bit nervous. Um, so usually I think I would say what a great pleasure it is to be with you and to present at the summer school, but everything is a little bit different. And um, the truth is I was very excited um, to when I got the email from Katarina to join the summer school. But I have also mixed feelings and I had increasingly mixed feelings over the last um, couple of weeks because when I got the schedule, I noticed that there were some really, really big beasts on that schedule. And for you students, that's absolutely amazing. But I have to tell you, it has been quite terrifying, terrifying for me the last couple of weeks. And um, so I was thinking about what to do about it. And I did what I usually do in these situations. I go back and read. And I was trying um, to prepare myself as good as I could. Um, um, but that didn't quite help this time either. And eventually I came to a feeling which is very nice depicted in this picture by um, Caspar David Friedrich, the monk at the sea. And the problem is that I chose three topics which are um, vast and like very, very deep oceans. Epigenomics is a very big field, it's fast moving. Um, and it seems bottomless, to be honest. Cancer biology has changed massively over the last decade or so. We have heard a lot about it already. Also a big, big area. And then machine learning, of course, very exciting, um, lots of developments. And there's no way that one can measure all these areas. So what to do in this case? What do you do when you feel like a monk and looking out at the sea? And this is, of, of course, even stronger the case when you are now in um, lockdown and COVID, you can't go to the lab in many cases. Um, but I was helped very much, I must say, by my team. So I've been independent for two years now and my team has joined me um, a year ago. So these are my fantastic three PhD students and my intern. Uh, and I want to say a big thank you to them, um, first of all. Um, and I want to say that Science is a team effort. And I think that the summer school is showing this even more. And I think um, with the help of this team, um, I can kind of plunge myself into the waves uh, and um, enjoy very much the summer school and see that we are working together uh, to achieve great things and to learn from each other. I want to say that I'm also having some beast uh, big beasts in my corner as well, I think. So we are obviously not working on our own, um, but um, because we are all working very interdisciplinary, I've already mentioned that we have, of course, experts um, um, who are supporting us, who are, who are advising us, who are criticizing us. And there are, again, more people from the summers, from the network um, that are making us stronger and making us better in what we are trying to do. And again, with that, I think I can um, end my little prologue here and start um, with the talk, but I do want to change the title of the talk. I have realized that. So instead of saying I'm doing machine learning for cancer epigenomics, I think what I can offer you is maybe take you on a leisurely walk through epigenomic landscapes. Um, this is kind of where I'm, I've been the last couple of years as a postdoc um, in Edinburgh. 
uh, and then continuing with us in my own lab. I think we are starting to have occasionally um, quite nice views onto um, uh, uh, other areas, I guess, neuro neuroscience uh, uh, initially, um, developmental biology, and more and more, so tumor tumorigenesis. So maybe some of the lessons that we are learning from this um, epigenomic uh, work are useful in this respect as well. And to be honest, I'm doing a lot of bioinformatics. We are collaborating a lot with biologists, as I've already said. But at times, we are also using machine learning. And we are trying to develop some tools. Um, um, but it's not always about machine learning. It's about um, the science, I guess. <clears throat> so um, also a lot of the um, uh, the other thing that I want to mention is, of course, that um, a lot of the projects that I'm going to talk about are very, in very early stages. They are work in progress. As I said, my students have joined me a year ago. Um, and also what I'm, I think is quite interesting, and we have seen that in the last, in, in some of the talks already, I think that sometimes when you read um, a very good um, paper, you have the feeling that the authors walk um, down a very straight alley, straight to the light. Um, and neither as, as a PhD student nor as a postdoc, I ever felt like that, um, even in very good labs. So I think science um, and biological science in particular has convoluted ways. Um, there are also there are negative results sometimes. Um, sometimes you really don't know where you go. And this view of a straight path towards the light is very often a, a view from the hint side. And um, I think um, we have to allow ourselves to, to get lost as well while keeping kind of an eye on our target. So um, we have already learned quite a lot. We have one, had one talk, for example, on genome-wide association studies. So we have a lot of data now available. Data on um, sequencing has become very um, cheap in a sense. So there's lots of data available there. And this has tri driven um, a lot of advant uh, advances and uh, discoveries. Um, so um, genome-wide um, association studies, for example, they, they look at individual particular diseases and then they try to find um, uh, genetic changes or mutations, SNPs, single nucleotide um, <coughs> variants um, that are associated with the genes. Um, so there's a, um, so we've heard about that. We also heard about the kind of, or maybe, one of the targets is also to, to, to go along the opposite way, to go from genetic changes um, to predictions about a particular disease. So maybe um, outcomes, um, risks for diseases, um, track responses, and so on. Again, this is powered to a large extent um, by um, the huge available um, data that we are seeing now in terms of sequencing. Um, and um, also by the advances in uh, machine learning uh, technology. So for example, in a paper by Palazzo et al, they used a lot of uh, a large collection of uh, somatic mutation data. Um, they trained an autoencoder model uh, to find a lower dimensional representation of these somatic mutation data. Uh, then they use kernel learning with hierarchical clustering um, to ask, um, assess the quality of these mutation embeddings. And eventually, they use the embeddings to classify two more subtypes. <clears throat> and that's, that, that's quite um, interesting and useful. Um, so a lot of these data is obviously taken from, from um, population data, from patients. Um, and that has, of course, a lot of advantages. Uh, advantages. Uh, it means that um, the, the disease, if you want, is studied in the organism of interest. It's studied in human, um, and it's studied in the disease context. Um, but And there's obviously a lot of data available in this respect. But it also has disadvantages or um, uh, yeah, problems um, associated with it. So in many cases, um, cause and effect, maybe years, maybe decades apart from each other. 
Uh, so somatic mutations may um, accumulate over a long period of time before they manifest themselves in, for example, cancer. And also you have a lot of inherent biases which are actually not causal um, for your mechanism. So it's, it's, it's not trivial to disentangle um, the two um, causes um, that, that, co that, that, um, that are responsible for, for the observations that we see. Um, right um, so on the other hand um, we can look at a molecular level and i've been um, much more um, concerned so that's more where i have been working over the um, last years i think so we can ask how do cells actually work um, so we can go from the genome to the to the cell level um, to a cellular state i wish uh, to be honest and sometimes i i um, I cheat myself into believing that I'm, I'm kind of working on the cellu um, cellular state. So this is a beautiful image, um, cryo-electron tomography of a uh, human fibroblast. And we see some of the proteins, uh, so the, nuclear pore uh, the, nucle the cell nucleus in blue and the nuclear pore complex and a lot of proteins. And it's really dense and, uh, and, and beautiful. Um, but actually that's not where I'm, most of the time operating and when I'm talking about the cellular state I have to admit to myself that I'm actually um, simplifying um, even further in many cases I'm actually thinking about the transcriptome and I'm, I'm not thinking about the cellular phenotype I'm not thinking about um, proteins so I'm, I'm, I'm trying just to connect the what we see in the genes in the genome to the cellular state and um, so, and, and somewhere in between there comes epigenomics. So how do we get from the genome to our particular trans, um, cellular state in, in the sense of a transcriptome? And I think that's where epigenomics plays an important role. Um, so, um, and this state of the cell is of course, um, still extremely complex. So I've said I'm going down from an in, in the individual, in a human, uh, to, a, to the cellular level, and still this is massively complex and complicated, and we heard some of this um, uh, in the previous talk as well. Um, so looking at, um, so however, what, I, what I'm interested in is also when I work with biologists and why this is a um, useful um, uh, system is because we can actually um, do interventions and do control e experiments and see what happens in order to um, get an idea of what individual genes are actually doing what their function is. So if you're looking at the molecular level, we can do uh, very much control ex experiments and we can ob observe the effects of um, the disturbance uh, within days in the in the case of knockouts but we can also use um, um, uh, fast degradation and then we see um, the effects within hours and that that can be very useful um, also to identify mediators for certain diseases and so on and to understand the mechanisms very well um, the problem is of course we can't do that in humans so very often we have a model system be it um, uh, mouse or uh, cell culture cells and it's often not in the right context in the tissue context or in the disease context but it's in cell cultures it's in uh, or, or in a, you know sometimes in vivo models so these are the downsides in the um, in to this approach and again I think in the previous talk we have already seen how these um, two approaches could be and should be how we should go back and forth between these approaches and how they can inform each other. Um, so how do you, um, epigenomics in this um, fall in there? So again, through Chivas, for example, we find um, that there we have we have been um, we found that there's. Um, uh, so in this paper by Bailey, for example, the cell paper, big um, paper in cell, um, there was a big comprehensive characterization of cancer driver genes and mutations um, where a lot of uh, 10,000 tumor samples were analyzed um, for 33 cancer types. 
And uh, so this is GVAS studies, of course, and in this, in this um, data set, they found 299 um, cancer driver genes. Uh, and again, these um, genes and mutations are actually shared across anatomical origins and cell types. And 57% of these tumors have a potentially actionable, actionable oncogenic events. So, um, this is quite um, interesting um, to know, and it's also very interesting to see that if we are cl um, classifying, if, if uh, we look at what kind of genes are actually found to be drivers for um, cancer, many of them um, happen to be epigenomic, um, associated with epigenomic mechanisms. So here's epigenetics. Uh, DNA modifiers, chromatin others, chromatin histone modifiers, histone modifications, uh, and so on. And what you can see is that they are um, that they are um, read in many different um, cancer types. So epigenetic mechanisms seem to be disturbed in cancer types. Um, why is this the case? So um, the, here are um, uh, some of the epigenetic mechanisms. They seem to alter the chromatin structure, which then leads to an ab aberrant gene expression and therefore introduces um, problems in terms of differentiation, metabolism, um, the stemness of the cells. So, um, so here we see how epigenomic mecha mechanisms and gaining a deeper understanding of these epigenetic um, um, proteins um, players can really help to also understand better uh, what comes out of these population um, uh, data studies and the, and, and, the, and the human data studies. And um, so what I want to do now is I want to actually think about what is epigenetics. I want to give you a very high level introduction to epigenetics maybe too high level, just because I really enjoy it, I must say. I, I'm really um, always um, still um, enjoying to, to talk about this, this aspect of, of, of cells. And um, yeah, uh, and then I'm digging deeper a little bit into um, three different um, parts of this epigenetic uh, machinery. I'm talking about DNA methylation chromatinary modulars and histone modifications. Um, right, so let's get started. Um, so as you all know, um, I um, um, so the genetic information um, is my, the, the genetic information is stored in a about two meter long DNA molecule in every single cell that I have in my body. Um, it's a very um, long, um, so it's not only long, two meters is a long, long bit of molecule, um, but it also stores a huge amount of information. It stores three billion letters, um, which is not, um, so yeah, there, it needs a lot of um, letters to, to um, encode what I am. Um, Charles Darwin only needed 4,000, uh, only, only needed a lot less to write his origin of species. So um, my DNA is about 4,000 copies of Charles Darwin's origin of species. That's um, quite remarkable. What is also remarkable is that um, I and you are made up of about 40 trillion cells. Um, so that's a whole universe. That's more than um, the um, that's more than an order of magnitude more than the stars in our galaxy. So uh, lots of stars, uh, uh, lots of um, cells in our body, and each of these each each of these cells obviously um, each of these cells contain this long DNA molecule, the two meter DNA molecule. Uh, and they are still all very different. So we have nerve cells, prokinia cells with a beautiful structure. Uh, we have the heart muscle cells, very different, very different function from nerve cells. We have T cells, we have hair, hair cells in our, in our inner ear that uh, helps us hearing. So they are very specialized in their phenotype and in their function. And yet um, they all share the same DNA. Um, um, on, 
On the other hand, um, I've already said that we can learn a lot by studying model organism. And so when we look, for example, at a Purkinje cell of a mouse, it looks surprisingly similar to a Purkinje cell of, of, of humans. So in this case, um, we have a similar phenotype, but a very, well, not very, but a different DNA. So what is it um, that makes a cell um, gives the cell its phenotype and function. Well, it depends on the specific genetic um, programs that are actually executed by the cell, um, so which is read or executed by the cell. So every cell, obviously, every cell type, obviously reads a different set um, of genes and, and the corresponding genetic programs. So this would now bring me um, to epigenetic mechanisms. So as you can see here on the right side, it's again an um, electrotromographic uh, rendering of a cell nucleus and the DNA in the cell nucleus. It's incredibly densely packed. So it does, uh, doesn't look anywhere like the beautiful library that I've shown you in the earlier um, images, a little bit more like under the bed of my daughters. Uh, so it's quite a mess. So how do you access efficiently, quickly, the information that you need? How do you find them if you don't want um, to read the whole molecule in order to find individual words? Um, and um, so the cell has a couple of tricks in its pockets. So um, it can, can um, chemically modify the DNA, um, thereby changing its physical properties uh, and use these kind of changes in the sense, um, well, I, I think of it um, like bookmarks. So, or if you're thinking of the DNA modulation, I'm kind of thinking about it like putting a bit of study tape around your DNA mod molecule. So even if you have it in a ball in your hand, you will easily find the piece where the sunny tape is and you don't have to read the whole two meters. So that's kind of a, a way of how I, look, I think about DNA modulation. But um, before I continue um, telling you about these individual mechanisms, I want to take a little break actually uh, and going back to the, um, uh, well, before I do that, I actually um, have to think about um, so, so epigenetics is actually a term that has been used um, over the time very differently and um, there are lots of misconceptions involved in it. And um, so there was a PNIS paper a couple of years back, for example, um, that um, talked about um, epigenomics in a similar sense that I'm going to talk to you um, about now saying that it has a lot to do with how, um, with the regulation of gene expression. And uh, Mark Taschner um, kind of depicted this concept and said that there are co core misconcepts. And he said, um, so in his paper, he said, finally to that dreaded word epigenetic. And he says, in particular, his tone modifications are often called epigenetic and one can only wonder why. So, so these are the three things that I've, I, I'm talking about, DNA modulation. Um, DNA mutilation, chromatin remodeling, histone modifications, uh, three um, physical um, changes to the DNA and the chromatin, um, and they are co commonly called epigenetics. But at the origin of the word epigenetics um, was maybe the uh, epigenetic landscape, which was coined by um, Beddington in Edinburgh. Um, and he was thinking before the concept of genes was even, um, before genes were even discovered about the idea of development and differentiation. And he thought that cells are moving from the pluripotent cell, uh, state to a differentiated cell um, state in a similar fashion as a ball is tra traveling downhill in a, in a landscape. And it can kind of commit to certain lineages based on the shape of this landscape and the ball has to tra travel um, downhill. He was assuming that um, this is a process that is not 
um, not reversible. So you start out with stem cells, with, with pluripotent cells. Um, you, you might have primed um, cells and then you, you commit to a certain lineage and you uh, continue to, to differentiate to the end. And if you are uh, following a different route in this landscape, then that leads to a different lineage. Um, very remarkably, um, he, he, he also understood that these developmental processes are driven by no changes in the DNA. At all. Okay. Uh, what is uh, what was then a very remarkable experiment, um, uh, uh, which led to the Nobel Prize in um, 2012, is that you can actually force the ball to walk upwards again. So you can um, reprogram um, uh, fibroblasts um, to 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 become pluripotent as well uh, again and. All you need to do for this is you need to force the expression of four very specific DNA binding um, proteins. Um, so, uh, and this was an experiment by Takashini and Yamanaka in 2006. So you need these four um, transcription factors um, to, to, to be expressed in the cell and that forces the um, the ball to travel uphill to reprogram to go back from a differentiated um, state to a pluripotent uh, state. So really it seems that the transcription factors are doing all the work that there is um, and I think that's the this, this misconcept that Patasha was, um, was considering that um, when you look at the um, uh, definition of epigenetics by um, Waddington, he says the process by which the genotype brings the phenotype into being, that is epigenetics. Um, it was also said that the system that regulate the expression of the library of specific, uh, specificities, that is the genetic material, ma material which is meant to be um, DNA and RNA sequence. So it's really about regulation and control. And it seems that potentially what, what, what is the driving force behind that is transcription factors and not um, the three mechanisms that I was referring to just now, from uh, DNA methylation, histone modification and remodeling. Um, so transcription factors are doing um, the heavy lifting. Um, so are the three epigenetic mechanisms um, epigenetic in the vertical sense, do they cause gene expression? Um, so th there's an, also an interesting paper, I think this is still an ongoing, to, to some extent, an ongoing um, debate to what is the, um, how much are they cause and how much are they affect? Um, so there was also an interesting paper by Gritters and Finetti from Edinburgh, um, where he showed that um, his tone modifications, for example, can actually be very well predicted from the binding of transcription factors. So it's possible that transcription factors are causing both the expression of genes and his tone modifications. And then it's then there's also a different um, definition of epigenomics, um, which says that maybe it's not. Um, which puts not the control into the, the um, focus, um, but the memory or inheritance. Um, so this, is the, this would be these two definitions, for example, where mitotically and or my, uh, my inheritable changes in gene function that cannot be explained by changes in the DNA sequence are what, what is epigenetics. So the idea would be that a gene is expressed and because it is expressed, the cell remembers that the state of, of an active transcription and then it deposits a uh, epigenetic mark to remember that this state, that this gene should be, um, should be, um, uh, uh, should be expressed. And, if the cell were to maintain its identity, it needs to remember um, which genes have to be expressed, even in the absence of, um, of the, the initial signal, the transcription factor um, binding. 
Um, so um, this is a depiction. Um, uh, this is maybe an idea of, of, of this. Um, this uh, I, yeah, this is a, a, a graphical demonstration of this a little bit. So epigenet epigenetic components act as barriers against accidental reprogramming. So you have you start from a pluripotent ce um, cell, uh, and you have certain precursor cells with very specific sets of transcription factors. Um, the cells then have developmentally induced um, ep specific epigenomic um, programs that prevent them from um, accidentally reprogramming into the old state. Um, and in the case of an altered, in the, in, a, in the case of disease, so for example, in cancer, your epigenome might be um, changed and therefore um, the cell um, can lose its identity or can take on an alternative identity. Um, so, I, I guess um, the the idea, the, the the definition of epigenetics with which I would go now, is actually um, that all of these mechanisms are possible. So um, Adrian Bird um, is, has defined it in the sense that epigenetics is the study of structural adaptations of chromosomal regions so as to register signal or perpetuate altered activity states. So in this case, what is epigenetics could either cause a change in expression, it could re register um, a, a state of expression or it could perpetuate it um, to the next um, throughout um, the cell cycle to the next generation of cells. Um, yes, so in this case, so this is the definition of epigenetics, which, which I'm, 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 I'm kind of settling. I think the precise, um, the precise um, causal um, structure is, is very much depending on the context and on, on the locus and so on. So, um, so there, um, it is not, and it's ongoing, it's an ongoing study, I think, which makes this so difficult and exciting. Right. Um, right, so with that, I'm, I'm now actually digging a little bit deeper into DNA modulation. So this was the first uh, epigenetic um, modification that I, I, I started to study a little bit, um, and it's potentially the best known one. So what it means is actually that um, uh, the DNA, uh, that there can be a methylated, um, the, a methyl group added to the cytosine on your DNA strand. Um, it happens so that cytosine methylation mainly occurs when a C is followed by a G, so we say in a CPG context. And this will be quite interesting because that means the CG is um, symmetric. So if you have CG on the forward strand, you also have CG on the reverse strand, on the so Watson and Creek strands. And um, therefore, um, this might, um, or this, this, this offers a possibility for, um, inherit, for memory, for inheritance. So when the cell divides and one strand is, um, is given to the one daughter cell and the other is given to the other daughter cell, both get the information of the methylated um, CPG and they, they can copy um, this, this um, CPG in this case. Um, what is also interesting is that um, CPG um, that there's in the in the mammalian genome there's a certain um, DNA methylation landscape um, that kind of is, is very um, commonly observable. Um, in particular, we find that CGs are actually depleted in the bulk genome, so we find a lot less CGs than we would ex ex um, expect by chance. And it turns out that these CPGs um, in the bulk genome are very often um, methylated, mainly methylated. However, there are certain regions in the genome 
which have a very high density of CPGs. Um, they are called CPG islands. And it turns out that these um, CPG islands are very often unmetulated. Um, so um, I should have said that this is a very common depiction of methylation. So you have, this would be the, um, the DNA strand. You have certain genes here, and um, then every CPG is uh, shown as, a, as one of these lollipops. And um, the methylated ones are the, the black ones, the unmethylated ones are the, the white ones. Um, and you also have any methylated ones. And um, what is also remarkable is that CG, um, CPG islands are very often found um, to um, overlap with promoter regions, also with enhancers, but very often with um, promoters. And, um, um, and there's a correlation there between methylation and um, active gene um, transcription. Um, so when we look at um, data sets, um, uh, whole genome um, um, methylation data sets, um, we can look, we can find um, patterns like that. Uh, so we have several genes down here, uh, and these are the tracks for different um, samples. So the top ones are blood, uh, then we have brain samples, and then we have spleen samples. Um, so it's the, the yellow tracks are the methylation tracks between zero and one. So in this case, it's, um, it's not single cell methylation, but it's bulk, um, uh, met, uh, bulk methylation. So one means that all cells that are um, sequenced have at a given CPG um, are, fu are fully methylated. Uh, and zero means that they, all of the cells are unmethylated. And we find that there's some uh, global pattern, I would say, where um, uh, globally we see that most of these cell types have the bulk genome here, which, which is highly methylated. And then there's a region here um, where there's a lot more structure, and this structure, um, it's generally unmethylated, but you have a fine structure here. Um, which is um, tissue specific. And these signals, this methylation signals are read out um, by um, epigenetic um, readers. Um, uh, I will use that, that, that term again. So one of the first readers um, for DNA methylation, actually the first epigenetic reader that was discovered, I think, um, by Adrian Bird in Edinburgh was um, MECP2, material CPG binding protein 2. Um, so it specifically recognizes methylated CPGs and binds to methylated CPGs. And interestingly, this, this gene uh, is very highly expressed in neurons and it is linked um, to a disease called Rats, Red syndrome. And um, Adrian has been studying this disease uh, for a very long time. And um, when I was in his lab, um, uh, I was also very much interested in MECP2 and how it's binding to, to the DNA and to the methylated CPG. So RAD syndrome is uh, uh, an aut uh, aut um, autism spectrum disorder, which affects um, little girls. Uh, so it's X-linked and um, the uh, girls develop almost normally for the first couple of months, up to maybe six months, nine months of age. And then they lose gradually abilities that they have already started uh, to gain. So of, very often if they have started to, so if it's a severe case, um, if they started to talk, um, they lose their ability. If they have started to walk, they, they lose some of this ability. Um, they get very, um, very um, bad seizures. Um, so someone has described it as imagine red syndrome. Uh, so red syndrome, imagine the symptoms, the symptoms of autism, cerebral um, palsy, Parkinson's, epilepsy, and anxiety disorders all in one little girl. So it's a very complex um, disorder, but it has a very surprisingly um, simple root. It has, so the root um, is mutations in this one gene. Um, however, it is not, so the, the, the mechanism, so despite us knowing um, that MECP2 is the cause of this 
um, disease or mutations in MECP2 are, are the causes for this disease. It's not entirely clear what MECP2 actually does in the neurons. Um, so, but what we what we learned, so we have we have looked at um, MECP2 conditional MECP2 knockout in mouse uh, neurons, and what we definitely learned is that the correct interpretation of methylation readout is absolutely essential for neuronal operation after a certain developmental stage. Um, Adrian has um, has shown in mau ma in engineered mice models again that the defect is actually really amazingly um, reversible. So if you um, uh, engineer the the MECP2 in such a way that you can actually turn it on again, um, then the mice um, have a normal um, survival chance chance and the symptoms are actually going away. So it's not a degenerative um, disease, but it's it's um, it's really important to be able to read out um, this methylation signals. And what was also, uh, so we were having a hard time with this project to some extent, because we were trying to, um, first of all, characterize where MECPT2 was binding precisely on the genome. And this is quite difficult because it's very different from the transcription factors. Transcription factors have, um, well-defined um, motives that they bind to, but methylated CPG is still very common in the genome, and it, it appears that it's binding almost everywhere in the neurons except for CPG islands. Um, so we showed that it's not only binding in, to CPG, uh, CP, methylated CPG, but also methylated CACs. Um, but as I said, it's difficult to characterize the binding behavior because it's quite universal. Um, so the specificity is quite interesting. So it's like many of the epigenetic um, mechanisms, the specificity is still quite puzzling. Um, and also the function. So the idea was actually that MECP2 is a repressor because it binds to um, methylated um, CPGs and methylated CPGs is correlated uh, with um, uh, silence transcription. But when we are disturbing the system, it turns out that actually the correlation with expression changes is not so great. Um, so I think the last word is not said in this respect. It's also, of course, that we are seeing a lot of um, indirect effects. So, um, so um, the, the cells are obviously adjusting um, to the loss of MECP2, and therefore we see those upregulated and downregulated genes. But this is only a, a little detour to, to show how important um, it, methylation is in the brain and how it is um, read out. Um, so, but I'm, we are now actually even more interested in the writing of this, this marker. So we have been talking about the reader, which is MECP2, one of the readers. Um, now we are interested in the writing. And I've already, um, said that this symmetry um, of the CGs provides a mechanism for cellular heritability. So we, we want to, and we want to understand that a little bit better. So <clears throat> actually what, it turns out that there are several enzymes that are writers. So there's DNMT3A and 3B, and they are called de, no, um, de novo methyl transferases. And then there's DNMT1, which is the maintenance methyl transferase. Um, so, and the DNMT1 is, is, is actually copying, um, so it is recognizing hemimethylated CPGs, so CPGs which are methylated only on one strand, and it's adding um, the methylation on the other. So it's basically copying the methylation from one strand to the other. And there are also active, um, there's also active demethylation going on through um, TET enzymes. So TET enzymes actively remove uh, methyl groups from the CPGs. So this is again showing the function of this DNMT1. So behind the replication fork, so when the DNA is replicated during cell division, um, uh, you can see that here's the parent strand. The parent strand has the methyl group in both cases 
uh, in both daughter cells in this case, and the newly synthesized strands are unmetylated. So that creates hemimethylated CPGs, which are recognized by DNMT1. It's recruited, DNMT1 is recruited to the replication fork. Um, and then this creates um, uh, fully methylated CPGs, so CPGs that are methylated on both strands. And this provides a mechanism for the cell to remember the methylation state, even when it's proliferating, when it's dividing. Mm -hmm. Um, so again, um, when we look at that, so we have the unmethylated CPG, so this is the DNA, uh, DNA methylation cycle, so we have unmethylated CPGs at the top, we have de novo methyl uh, transferases, DN, DNMT3A and B, which can establish um, hemimethylated CPGs. Um, then DNMT1 copies the methylation from uh, state from one strand to the other, creating fully methylated CPGs. There's a number of enzymes, the TETA enzymes, uh, which um, can um, turn the methylated CPGs back to the unmethylated form through some intermediate states. And then in addition, we have passive um, loss of methylation through cell um, division. So every time a cell divides, um, the newly synthesized strand in the beginning is unmethylated. So that's also a way of creating unmethylated CPG. So if you have unmethylated CPGs and the cell divides, then you will have two unmethylated CPGs. If you have fully CPG methylated um, uh, CPGs, then you will create two hemimethylated CPGs and you need the DNMT1 to, to uh, get back to the fully methylated stage. And so the DNMT1 is really what provides a, a, a memory or a, an epigenomic memory to maintain the cell identity. And there's plasticity provided to these patterns by enzymes like DNMT3A and B and, TET, uh, and the TET enzymes, which allow um, dynamic changes during differentiation. So and now the question for us was, what happens if we are actually knocking out DNMT1 and we are interrupting this epigenomic memory um, system? And again, we do that because we have already seen what an important role um, methylation and MECP2 is play, playing in the mouse brain. Um, we have been uh, doing that in a conditional knockout in, in embryonic uh, mice and um, uh, in embryonic uh, mouse brain. And this is... Um, done um, by Sabine Lacker. Uh, so we both worked in Adrian's lab um, before she was a postdoc working um, in the, on, on the wet benches and um, was the computational um, biologist. And uh, she got her own group now at the wet med in Vienna. And um, I've got my group uh, in, in Tübingen and Dundee and we continue to work together, to be working together. And it's a lot of, and we enjoy that greatly. Um, so in this case, uh, what Sabine has done, she has created this knockout strategy <coughs> where um, uh, in um, where DNMT1 is um, deleted specifically in um, in in um, in embryonal brains in neurons. Um, so th this model is quite exciting because um, this uh, in her uh, her mice actually survive for quite some time postnatally, and this allows us to study this very crucial um, time after birth. Um, so there's uh, other mice um, which where, where they have equally aimed um, to understand the function of DNMT1 and um, usually these, these mice are not viable, they die at birth. Uh, so what we are seeing here is now that the protein DNMT1 um, is at embryonic day 16. There's not very much DNMT1 expressed in wild type. It's not there in knockout, but at birth um, there's a lot of DNMT1 um, in the wild type at the knockout, none as expected, and then it goes down 
in the wild type again up to um, the uh, day 13 post birth. Um, so when we look at the phenotype of the mice, what we see is that at birth, um, there's practically no phenotype at birth. However, the knockout, uh, knockouts die within 15 days. Um, so they have, um, um, and they, it appears that they are, they, they, their development is practically interrupted. So in particular, their brain don't seem to fully differentiate. It stays in a almost um, birth-like state and um, while the, the, the wild type mouse um, uh, grows and the brain fully develops, this is not happening in the knockout. When we are looking at the methylation patterns, we are seeing indeed that um, in the knockout, um, we have um, globally lost a lot of methylation. Um, when we are looking at individual CPGs and we are comparing individual um, mice, uh, we see that they are very highly correlated. So the methylation levels are very highly correlated and this is whole brain data actually. So, so it's interesting that um, the, the state of the methylation is actually really well correlated between individuals. In the knockouts, we observe indeed that we don't see any fully methylated CPGs because um, uh, DNMT1 is obviously missing and the correlation uh, is to some, ex uh, some extent lost. However, what is interesting is that when we look at triplets of CPGs which are very close um, together, uh, so CPGs which are neighboring, um, then there's a large correlation be between these sites, and this correlation is actually conserved between wild type and knockout. So some functions seem to be um, of the DNA methylation of the, the pattern doesn't seem to be destroyed totally um, through the, the um, DNMT1 knockout, uh, but there are clear um, deficiencies. Now, uh, we are also interested in how the transcriptome is changing. So how is this um, cellular state changing uh, upon this intervention? And again, unfortunately, we only have um, bulk data um, and not single cell data, but luckily um, in recent times, um, there has been single cell data for mouse brain um, become available and we can use this um, data uh, to deconvolute um, our bulk um, analysis. So we have obviously a number of different cell types uh, in our mixture and we can only um, measure, we have only measured however the average gene expression instead of the mixture. Um, but um, thanks to this, um, this, this huge um, collection from 2018 of single cell profiling of the develop, developing mouse brain, um, we can uh, use this data and the, the, the transcriptomes of 73 clusters, cell types, um, to make sense of our bulk data. And we are using a deconvolution strategy for that. So these are the neural subtypes which are all found by the single cell data. Um, and, uh, and we are using non-negative matrix factorization to take advantage of the single cell data set in order to make sense out of our bulk RNA-seq data set. So the idea is obviously that um, the RNA-seq bulk data um, is a mixture out of, um, uh, of the um, individual cell types uh, and the fraction of the cell types, the proportion is unknown and we are trying to, um, to estimate these, these unknown cell types. Um, we can also use ensemble methods. Um, uh, if we have several reference genomes in order to improve our, our estimation of the individual cell types. Um, so this, um, uh, these tools have been um, uh, suggested by Wang et al. and by Dong et al. And we have seen that there are quite some challenges, so we try to apply them. There were quite some challenges um, because the new technology, single cell technology, 
um, allows for way more nuclei, nuclei and um, this deconvolution methods were initially not um, readily um, capable of, of dealing with so many um, nuclei. Also, um, uh, the deconvolution methods have been built um, with only a relatively small data sets and tested with five clusters. Here we have 73. And we also don't have a fully matching um, uh, data set. So there was quite um, a lot of uh, uh, work by my student, Chris, who, uh, who was looking into that. Uh, I think the biggest challenge uh, was the selection of the marker genes, one of the biggest um, um, uh, challenge. And um, so the selection of marker genes for the individual um, cell types. That has a huge effect on the results of the deconvolution. Um, but I think he did a good job and he managed that. And we are looking now particular at oligodendrocytes, uh, which um, are one particular cell types in the um, central nervous system. They produce the myelin, um, which is kind of the insulating layer that forms around nerves. And this allows um, the electrical, electrical impulses to transmit quickly and efficiently along the nerve cells. So it's, um, um, and the oligodendrocytes, um, the, their differentiation goes through several steps uh, from neural uh, stem cells to oligodendrocytes precursor cells, co committed oligodendrocyte precursors, and so on, up to um, the mature oligodendrocytes. And some of these differentiation happen postnatally. Mm -hmm. So what we can, uh, so Chris has now re-embedded um, the single cell data and then used that um, to, un to understand our own um, um, bulk data. Um, so here we, we start um, with, um, with, the, with our simulated data um, out of the single cell data that's at um, postnatal day two and 11. And what you can see is that uh, at later stages um, of, uh, so at, at day 11, um, the further developed um, uh, differentiated cell types are higher expressed than at P2. And our own data is taken at P5. Uh, and we have wild type, uh, we are showing here the wild type um, data. So it look, it's all pretty nicely within, um, so between the P2 and P5, such a, suggesting that we are getting the, um, the, that we are getting the proportions um, quite right. Um, and also the replicas are fairly similar. Um, but if we are looking at the control at the DNMT1 knockout, we see that um, the increase of the differentiated cell types is not happening um, as it should uh, at this um, uh, day five. So it seems that we have um, a differential uh, differentiation problem, uh, and we can. Um, identify the exact stage where this happens now. So we can um, say that from this, from this cell type, um, which is identified here as 58 towards 56, there's clearly a problem in the difference, um, differentiation. And we can also look at individual genes, uh, which are down-regulated uh, down -regulated in the knockout and see how they are, um, uh, where they are expressed um, in the um, pseudo time of the single cell data. And that's quite interesting for us. Um, so I'm not going to go further into detail, but what I find quite interesting, so from a high level understanding, is that um, if we are disturbing the system here, this memory system really, the DNMT1, um, then um, what happens is that we are actually seeing problems in differentiation. So it means that actually um, we need to remember um, the state that we are coming from. We need to integrate the changes in order to, um, to become something new. Um, and that is um, quite interesting, I think. Um, so here are some very high level um, 
lessons from this this experiment. Um, so DNA methylation. Uh, so the first one is is that DNA methylation is a composite signal. Um, there are several writers that establish it, and I think there's also different levels on which it is scales on which it is read. Um, so we have already seen this plot of different tissues. Um, and um, we see that at, sc at certain scales, it seems that these tish tissues are very similar. So the bulk genome seems to be similar. And then this, this area of high cell density is also is a bit different. Um, but so the, the landscape, so the landscape of establishing the bulk genome, which is fully methylated and CPG islands, which, is, which are unmethylated, which depends largely on the density of CPGs is one level um, it's, it's one part of the signal and then we have a fine structure um, which needs to be um, uh, cell type specific and dynamic. And I think when we want to interpret the DNA methylation, we have to remember that it is established in several processes with competing enzymes writing and erasing it, taking information from different sources. So for example, from the parent strand um, or from transcription factors, which might recruit DNN, DNN, uh, DNMT1, uh, DNMT3 for de novo methylation, and um, also through the density um, of CPGs. So it's a composite si signal and it's probably interpreted on different levels. I think it's also interesting to see um, that the phenotype really hits it after birth. Um, so this is a moment when, um, when the brain really has to start integrating a lot of information. So, so it has to, to start in, um, processing gravity, it has to start breathing, it has to start. Uh, so there's a lot of information, information coming into, into the brain and this information needs to be processed. And there needs to be a mediator to integrate the external stimuli. And there's a lot of evidence that DNA methylation could be one of these med, um, mediators. And that's why DNA, DNA methylation plays such an important role also in learning, um, in memory formation. It's um, occurring again in old age, in neurodegenerative um, diseases, in Alzheimer's, for example. Um, so I think DNA methylation might give the cell the chance to, um, to process external information. And I said, I'm giving you some glances on the cancer landscape. I think this opens also, um, makes the cell vulnerable to changes from the outside world, which are then also integrated and, and somewhat stored in the um, methylation patterns. I think what we are also seeing is that the cells need a memory and the DNMT1 can be one of these memories, um, memory function. And they need the memory not only to stay the same, but also to become something different. So you need to be aware from where you're coming to where you're going in order to, to, to achieve that. So as I said, that was high level, um, high level ideas, um, lessons that I, Seem that, that I thought interesting about this project and what I think could help understand the NMT1 also in other contexts. So now I'm actually also working um, with Gerda Ecker, which happens to be a Sabine's sister, uh, and she's also working on DNMT1, um, in this case, in the uh, NPM arc positive anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Um, so in this case, we have a very similar, we have a similar setup. So we are looking at a rare and very aggressive non-Hodgkin lymphoma of T cell origin. Um, it is driven by constitutive activation of the oncogenic anaplastic lymphoma kinase ALK. So um, just by introducing this gene ALK, uh, we can determ deterministically um, create a model of this um, uh, lymphoma. Um, so NPM ALK transgenic mice develop tumor in the tumors and they de die at the age of 15 to 13 weeks. What is interesting in this NPM-ALK transgenic mice is that they have 
um, DNMT1, seem to be expressing um, DNMT1 um, to a high extent. So here's a control cell line, and you see that DNMT1 is, is not very strongly expressed, but in the ALK, um, uh, in the ALK cells, DNMT1 becomes expressed. So um, what um, Gerda has now done is she has conditionally deleted DNMT1 in T cells in the background of the NPM ALK transgenic mice. And what, what she found um, uh, amazingly is that um, this conditional deletion of DNMT1 impairs the tumor formation. Um, so here you see the um, survival times for the control mice for um, the DNMT1. So if you only knock out DNMT1, it doesn't um, hurt these mice in this case very much. If we are looking at the, um, at the oncogene, the ALK, um, the mice die after about less than 30, um, 30 days. And um, then there's a double mutant. So um, the ALK knockout, this one, the purple line, it, it's, it's back to, um, to the control. And you can see that here as well. So we have a, the tumors of a control mouse of the DNMT1 knockout mouse, nothing much happens here. Um, then of the ALK, so this, this um, uh, tumor formation, and in the ALK knockout, it's almost back to, um, to the control. So again, we are studying um, this, in this case, reduced representation by sulfate sequencing, the DNA methylation. Um, we have wild type mice, we have tumor mice, we have three knockout mice, and then we have the double mutant. And we see, um, so the phenotype, again, the phenotype is the, the biggest phenotype we see in the tumor samples, but overall the tumor um, samples have not lost an awful lot of DNA methylation. We see that the double mutant, on the other hand, have lost a lot of methylation. Um, then the, if you just knock out DNMT1, not so much. Um, so it seems that there's, there, so the, the strong phenotype uh, in the tumor sample is not, a, uh, so, so there's, a, there's not much loss overall of DNA methylation and there seems to be a bigger effect in the ALK knockout. Okay, so if we look at differentiated methylated CPGs, we find again that the ALK knockout has the highest number of hypomethylated CPGs. Uh, there, so there are both hypo and hypermethylated CPGs in the tumor, and there's not so much happening in the in the knockout. Um, so in the in the tumors. Um, so I think one thing that we have to keep in mind here is that the tumor cells are not um, not proliferating so much anymore. Um, so they might not need the DNMT1 for that reason. The tumors tumor cells start um, proliferating a lot more again. So they they see a lot of changes, and the changes are um, um, are uh, propagated. And then also in the ALK knockout, we see changes, but we don't see the tumor formation. Um, what we are seeing here is that the changes to DNM to the CPGs are most dramatic um, actually in the tumor. So we see most, there might not be so many CPGs that, that lose methylation, but um, when they lose methylation, then they lose a lot of it. So they go from 100% methylated to zero methylated. And I'm looking again at the correlation between neighboring sites. And in this case, um, the, um, uh, the data is not, um, uh, not quite as, uh, the coverage is not quite as good, but we see again that there's a high correlation between neighboring sites in this case. Um, which in the tumor cells now um, is somehow broken. So the, the DNMT1 knockout doesn't seem to affect um, this cooperativity between no, um, uh, neighboring sites, um, but the tumor does. And in the ALK, um, ALK, in the double mutant, again, the correlation seems to be um, maintained. So um, this brings us to a typical hallmark of cancer, um, which is that um, 
the um, uh, which is that this methylation landscape that I've been describing earlier, where we have methylated um, bulk genomes and unmethylated uh, CPG islands is kind of destroyed. So we see now that, um, that there are um, hypermethylated CPG islands and the bulk um, genome is losing, um, uh, is, is losing some of the methylation. So the contrast between these functional elements, the CGIs, and the rest of the genome is kind of destroyed. But that's, this is not a function of the DNMT1, but it's rather a function of the other enzymes of DNMT3A and B uh, and the TET enzymes. So again, we are trying to also look at the um, transcriptome states. And again, we were lucky. Um, so there has been, a, a, so again, it's, it's we, we only had um, bulk data at the time, um, but um, uh, there's a cell atlas for human tumic development that defines the T cell rep repertoire. And um, here we have additional challenges, um, or Chris had these challenges, I must say the student, um, because again, in the tumor sample, we find, uh, of course, not just the tumor cells, but we also find um, tumor cells that are different and heterogeneous from this reference data that said that we are using um, for the deconvolution. And that is quite tricky, I think, to quantify and uh, to make sense out of it. But we are now quite positive that um, we are seeing that the um, um, tumor cells are originating from a relatively early um, um, uh, cell, uh, uh, cell, the double negative, the quiescent double negative um, cells. Um, and we are also looking at how if we are deconvoluting um, the bulk data with different single cell data sets from different um, uh, um, developmental stages, we find again that the tumor seems to be originating from a relatively early time point and not um, as we would expect from the later time point where we actually uh, looked at it. So, <clears throat> Again, what are the kind of um, global lessons um, uh, of this project um, of the DNMT1 knockout in, in this uh, large cell lymphoma? Well, what we found is that the expression of a single oncogene um, is able to induce large alterations in the DNA methylation um, uh, landscape during tumoral genesis. Um, ALK positive tumors lose the ability for collaborative DNA methylation. Um, so um, the correlation between nearby CPG sites seem to be lost and therefore the, the general landscape is destroyed. So if we destroy, if we delete DNMT1 in this genetic background, um, tumorigenesis is abrogated um, despite the activity of the oncogene ALK. And, um, gene expression and epigenomic data po point also we find that MUC is actually um, um, necessary, the induction of MUC is uh, necessary to induce the tumor um, reprogramming. Um, so, but the complete reprogramming requires an epigenomic reprogram reprogramming mediated by DNMT1. So if you can't do the um, epigenomic reprogramming, um, then we can't change the um, transcriptome towards the tumor transcriptome as, as we observe in the oncogene. We also seem to, um, to be able to show that the origin of ALK lymphoma might be a small subset of immature, immature T cells, but there's still a little, a little bit of work to be done. Um, so um, this was the biggest bit, I think, about DNA methylation. Um, I'm going very briefly about um, uh, over other um, epigenetic um, mechanisms. One of them is chroma, uh, chromatin remodelers. Um, so I have uh, what you are seeing here is that the DNA 
doesn't only use um, methylation, but it's also wrapped around these proteins. They are called, called histones. And um, the histones, so it's, it's organizing um, the packaging in the DNA, um, uh, in the cell nucleus. And um, <clears throat> there are so-called chromatin remodelers, which can um, eject dimers from these proteins. Um, they can eject um, complete nucleosomes, and they also can uh, lead to a sliding of the nucleosomes. And what you can imagine is that transcription factor binding sites, for example, that are um, in this bit of the DNA, um, where the nucleosome has become more or less accessible through the, through the action of um, these um, ATP-dependent chromatin remodeling complexes. And um, interestingly, these um, chromatin remodeling complexes um, play in a, in a more, in an enormous role in many different cancer types, and um, their, their importance are, we are, we are just at the beginning of understanding their importance. So one of these um, remodelers, or um, in humans, there are actually three um, remodeling complexes, and um, as you can say, see, they are very, um, they, are, uh, they consist of many sub-proteins. Um, um, for example, ARID1A, it's, it's one of the genes that pops up very, very often in all kinds of different cancer types. And it is interesting that, um, that these different um, that these different components have all different specificities for tissue specific cancers and neurological um, disorders. So again, what we are seeing is DNA methylation and chromatin remodeling seems to be working um, across the genome everywhere, but still um, there is some specificity. Um, uh, inbuilt and it is we are only starting to understand where the specificity is coming from um, uh, in this um, this is another collaboration um, with uh, a colleague from Dundee professor Tom Owen Hughes and he's um, looking at um, arid 1a and in this case um, it's done in ES cell lines and what is quite exciting is that it's not a knockout experiment, but rather it's a very fast degradation of ARID1. And therefore, what we can observe are the changes, the induced changes over time, which then um, help us to identify primary targets um, from secondary and indirect effects. So over time, so this is the pathways uh, for cancer, and we, you can now actually see how over time um, the changes are propagating um, through these different um, cells. And the way we are studying, so another student of mine, Tanmaji, is studying that, and we are having help as well from Dominic Jansing, who is in Tübingen, and he's working for Amazon Research. And here, um, what we are wanting to do, we want to understand time course data, and we want to imply um, causality, or we want to infer causality. We want to infer between direct and indirect effects using these time course data sets. Um, and um, currently, we are working with Granger causality. Um, we are using, uh, again, a tool called BETS. Um, that has already implemented um, um, uh, Granger causality for time course data. I think uh, it, it's implementing a stability selection criteria and um, to come up with, our, uh, with, with um, not too many false um, positives. Um, but I think at the current stage, um, this is still a very challenging um, project. Um, mainly because we have very few time points and very few replicas. So something that is very common in, um, in, um, in biology, of course. Um, so we are thinking at the moment very hard in how to move from causal discovery to including uh, knowledge that we have already got uh, and, um, and, and direct um, the discovery in this uh, way. But what we have found, uh, so our initial results seem to be uh, at least um, picking, seem to 
pick up some of the pathways, some of the genes that are also parental genes and in the right order in known pathways. But as I said, this is very much ongoing work. Um, there's a lot of open questions, I think, um, with regard to chromatin remodelers. So it's, it's very unclear how the cell type specificities um, achieved in individual components. And then it's also not clear how changes can be propagated during the cell cycle and if they can be um, propagated. So how is there a memory involved? And this would be um, quite important for the epigenetic mechanism as well. I'm very quickly moving on to um, the last of the three uh, epigenetic um, um, mechanisms, namely his tone modifications. So not only can these nucleosomes be um, positioned at certain um, places, but they can also be decorated with other chemical modifications. And again, we have epigenetic writers um, that establish certain um, modifications. So in this case, it's H3K4 tree methylation. Um, so that just means that histone, so this, these are octomers, and histone three has a lysine at position four, and this is decorated with a, a tree methylation group. Um, so, and there are in humans actually six writers which all write this one um, epigenetic mark. There's a number of different epigenetic readers that recognize specifically um, these histone modifications, and H3K4 tree methylation is only one of several. So you have also, for example, H3K27 methylation, which has a no number of different writers um, which establish them. Um, and uh, we can measure all of these histone modifications in, um, well, um, it's difficult to measure them all in um, the same cell, but we can do that in, um, of course, so bulk data. Um, so this would be, in this case, different genes in the yeast genome. And each of these tracks are one histone modification. Um, and what we are finding is that some histone modification are correlated with silencing, while others are correlated with active gene expression. Again, um, we observe that there are dynamic changes of these epigenomic patterns. There are dynamic changes during development and differentiation. There are dynamic changes during memory formation and consolidation. Uh, and we also see that there are abnormal changes of epigenomic patterns. So for example, during tumorigenesis or during aging, uh, we find that the epigenomic patterns are changing. Um, so there are a number of challenges where machine learning comes into play, I would say, um, for uh, histone modifications. Um, so one of them is, of course, that the data is extremely high dimensional. It's not independent. You can see that some of the histone modification down here look very similar. Um, so there's room for manifold detection, dimensionality reduction methods, and so on. The data is actually really sparse. We have lots of data, but each cell has a different epigenome. So um, it is um, it, certainly a, every cell type is um, expected to have a different epigenome, but potentially also every cell. Um, so um, we have, um, so there has been an imputation challenge um, where uh, by the ENCODE um, consortium, uh, so the goal of ENCODE is to build a comprehensive parts list of functional elements in the human genome. Um, but performing all of these assays is, is really expensive and in some cell types it's, it's really challenging. Um, so there are potentially computation methods that are capable of predicting the outcomes of the uh, assays. Uh, and that's um, therefore the ENCODE imputation challenge was, um, was, was initiated to compare methods for imputing data. Um, uh, so one of the um, 
I think I'm, I'm a bit running out of time, so I'm not going to say very much about that. Um, but um, there's a, Avocado has provided a multi-scale deep tensor factorization method um, where basically we have factors along the assay dimension, the cell type um, dimension, and also a genomic uh, position dimension. Uh, and these are um, these embeddings are learned simultaneously and then a neural network is used um, to combine them and, and form a final product uh, a prediction for a given new unobserved cell type assay and genomic um, factor combination. And um, Alex has worked significantly um, on a new method um, and he has done uh, particularly well in this challenge and was the second runner up in the um, in the preliminary results. I think he's now number three, or, but did it really well in this. Um, I want to again um, say that we have to be considerate that, that this is based on correlation and eventually I think there too we want to move for, further towards causality. Um, what we are seeing is that um, if we are removing parts of the histone modifications, then sometimes we don't actually see an effect on gene prediction. So we don't quite understand yet what the purpose, um, uh, uh, how these epigenomic, um, um, uh, these histone modifications are interpreted. So there's for a long time has been in the room the idea of an histone code. So our epigenomic uh, in histone modifications instructions for gene expression. So you have writers and readers and they are correlated with, with expression states. But then of course also a code could be a system of symbols that represent a message or record an information like, uh, like this code in a library which records who has actually read the book. In this case, um, the, the, the writer would um, the the um, the expression would cause the writing rather than the other way around, and then of course there's the possibility, which I think is the most likely, is that there's a his that that it is books that it's instructing for gene expression and also recording of previous transcription, uh, and therefore we need to understand the local um, causality structure better. Um, Again, it's hugely important for all kinds of diseases. So if you're only looking at a single mark HVK4 tree methylation, and we look at the protein family of the writers, we find that they are involved in a huge array of neurodevelopmental syndromes. And also in, um, they are all involved in different cancer types. Um, so understanding what these epigenomic patterns mean is hugely important. So I think that this is kind of the bigger idea is um, the identification of a local causality structure. With that, um, I, I want to come to a closure. Um, I think I will give you the very last definition of epigenetics. Um, Adrian Bird in 2007 said, epigenetics is a useful word if you don't know what's going on. If you do, you use something else. Um, so, um, so I think that's, that's quite useful to know. It's, it's useful that epigenetics is still around. That means that there's a lot of things that we don't know and a lot of room for you potentially to discover. Um, I want to kind of go back to the beginning of my talk um, and, and also reflect on what I've learned through my research maybe um, for, for, for life as a scientist as well. So of course it's okay to feel out of place. Um, even that big beasts do, I know that. I think it's important that we work as a team, that we ask, that we help. I think that we help out each other. Um, I think that it's crucial to know the past because that allows us to change. Um, I think we have to allow ourselves to be puzzled. Um, I, I think it feels very uncomfortable. Sometimes we want to know and we want to know the causes but I think this feeling of puzzledness is very important and it's where the discoveries come from. That's what Adrian's um, definition um, said. I think at the end of the day, we just need to swim. We need to plunge ourselves in the water and we also need to be thoughtful of the bigger picture where our science um, is, is, is changing. Um, 
uh, and interacting with society, I guess. And with that, I want to thank, I want to thank uh, foremost my uh, team, my little team, uh, Tanmaji, Giovanni and Alex. And I want to thank um, my collaborators, which I have mentioned mostly. And I want to um, also appreciate the funding um, that helps uh, to do this research. And that's me. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, um, Gabriele, for this very interesting talk. We already have one question from Christel. Christel, please. Hi. Um, excellent talk. Um, I've learned a lot. Um, so I'm not so much into epigeno uh, epigenomics, but um, so if you would think of it in terms of Waddington, um, so as processes by which the genotype helps the phenotype into being, I was just wondering, have these processes themselves changed from an um, evolutionary perspective as well? Uh, yes, <laughs> they have massively. And um, um, yeah, I think that's, that's uh, another um, very vast area. So um, methylation, for example, is not observed in C. elegans, for example, or in Trisophila, if I'm not um, mistaken. Um, methylation in plants is completely different. Um, so I think the, some of the epigenetic um, machinery, so I'm calling epigenetics, the, so, but that's kind of for myself to sort things. I'm calling epigenetics um, the um, machinery, the readers and writers, and I'm calling epigenomics the, the patterns. I think epigenetics is conserved between um, so a lot of the epigenetic machinery, the, the proteins are conserved between mouse and humans, for example. So that's why, I, why it makes sense to use these model organisms. Um, so the histone modifications, the, the readers, the KMT2 family, for example, um, there are only three in Trisophila, um, so they have doubled. Um, um, so there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of evolution going on. Um, I think also if you look at the um, epigenomic patterns, um, so for example, promoters seem to be very well, so seem to have very similar epigenomic um, patterns, but enhancers seem to be not so well shared across organisms, for example. Because I was also trying to put it then in the context of population genetics. So I'm primarily looking at uh, genetics in relationship to um, transcriptomics, etc., where of course population structure is a very important uh, aspect. And I was just wondering, you know, where does then this epigenetics or epigenomics comes in? So is do you also see population differences? I mean, so when we stick to one organism, humans, is there yes, also I, an evolutionary I, I, aspect? I think absolutely. I think the part of the, but it, it depends on the time scale again. I think um, you, you see, um, I mean, part of the epigenomic system is that it's, I think part of its function is, is that it's dynamic, that it's different. Uh, so I haven't talked about it, but um, for example, we can see, um, of course, methylation is changing over age. Um, so within within the same individual, it's changing over time. And I think it's, it's changing over, um, if, it's, if it's parts of its function is to integrate external stimuli, uh, then you, you would expect that a lot of it is changing. But I think, again, we have to remember that it's a composite signal. So some bits are, I think, um, part, so, um, okay, uh, I'm not sure I can answer that correctly, but um, I think parts are determined by devel developmental processes and parts are de um, determined by integrating additional signals. Thank you. It's going to be very complex, right, to take all of that into account. Yeah, uh, yeah it's like two different time frames, right, that you need to take into account in the, in the analysis. Um, yes, yeah. um, I think it's even more than that, um, because I suppose that transcription factors could 
um, work on a completely different time scale than histone modifications, and histone modifications work on a different time scale from um, uh, DNA methylation, and they are interacting. So if you if you are if you're recruiting histone, modific histone modification writers, you would also change um, potentially the methylation and vice versa. Um, so it's it's a way potentially to write into from a long term from a short term memory into a long term memory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. There are some questions on Slido. I'm just going to read them out. Uh, so one is, does methylation in promoters silence gene expression or is the lack of gene expression allowing for more methylation? I think there's example for both. Um, so I think that um, yeah, I think that we tend to want global answers and I think that this is kind of um, problematic. So I think uh, we can we can find enough evidence that we can actually switch, have epigenetic switches where we can switch, uh, where we can switch on transcription through changes to the epigenomic patterns. But we also see that epigenomic patterns, changes of epigenomic patterns don't have an effect on, on transcription. So I think it is local specific. Okay, thank you. And context specific. Right. Um, and the second question is, are CPG methylation patterns observed in DNMT1 knockouts at birth inherited? Do they die sooner because of the impossibility to maintain them? Uh, can you, can you um, repeat the question? Yep. Are CPG methylation patterns observed in DNMT1 knockouts at birth inherited? Do they die sooner? because of the impossibility to maintain them. Um, okay, so we, we are lacking a lot of data, unfortunately. So ideally, we would have to look at the DNN, DNMT1 methylation at different time points. Uh, so right after birth, then after a couple of days, and then shortly before death. I mean, there's some ethical consideration because all of these are animal um, experiments, and so we cannot um, we cannot all do these experiments, unfortunately. So we have so far only observed DNA methylation um, after, at day um, 12, I think, uh, after birth. So I cannot fully answer the question. Um, I, I think that there's some um, that there's kind of a default um, pattern, um, and um, the default pattern, which is potentially um, governed by the uh, which is governed, for example, by the density of CPGs um, and C, C and Gs. Um, so what we are observing, for example, is that when we um, use artificial DNA and engineer that into, into cells, um, then we can predict um, the methylation states of this artificial DNA based on the density of the CPGs and the density of CNGs. Um, so this is one, one information that needs to be read out to establish the patterns. Additional, what the cell needs is transcription factors, I think, that recruit DNA, DNA MT1 um, at some, some point. And then when they di divide, they also copy the information from the parent strand. And I, I, I suppose when you want to, and one of these mechanisms is missing when DNA MT1 is, is gone. And, and that's, I think, to copy the changed states. So you need to integrate that you need to remember, so when you go through the differentiation, um, you, you first change some CPGs and then the next and then the next, and therefore you move away from the default state and you need to remember what you did and you copied every step to the next generation. And if you can't do that, I think you can't differentiate, but that's kind of a rough idea. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And so we have one last question from Sashti Kumar Yoti. Um, first of all, he says, great work and wonderful presentation. And then you mentioned about imputation to handle missing data, but it will be helpful if you could expand more in details. Um, he's mostly talking about the sparse and NA values in some of 
the data you were talking about and how you use this with machine learning? Um, right. Um, so, um, so the idea is that you can have, you can learn an embedding for, for example, for the cell type, you can learn an embedding um, for, um, so for the cell type, for the, um, for the cell type, for the assay, and also for the local position. Um, and um, if you are learning these embeddings, um, you can then combine them um, with a new, feed them into a neural network and learn a function to combine them and to create um, a prediction for another cell in this tensor that is missing. So I think the problem is that, um, um, that you need to have the right combination. Uh, well, at every, every time you predict, you have a different set of assays and a different vector of assays um, and um, cell types from which you can learn. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is that you can actually, um, instead of using the embeddings of the genomic position and the cells, uh, well, in particular the genomic position, you can actually use the observed measurements and you can have an embedding for that one as well. Um, so, so this is, I think this would be a subject of a whole talk. Okay, great, thanks a lot. And I think there are no further questions. So also you get a round of virtual applause and thanks a lot for your very nice presentation.